Hi, and welcome back to another episode of Tuba People TV, where we talk about Arnold Jacobs all of the time. Puddles and I are here with Eric Carlson of the Philadelphia Orchestra here and uh, next to the great Sakandaga Lake. It's beautiful out there. Yeah. Did yeah. I get that right? You got that right. All right. We just were out on the lake. Eric uh, took us out on the lake, although Puddles stayed behind. He didn't go, but Emily, who's behind the camera, went. She waves high. So Eric, thanks so much. We've been uh, working on getting together for a couple of years now and uh, appreciate you hanging in there with me. That's nice to do this. Yeah. Um, need very little introduction. Uh, Tremonis with the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra, prior to that, Baltimore Symphony, prior to that, North Carolina Symphony. Right. And uh, prior to that, you were just a regular old high schooler. Well, college. College, okay. But yeah. I started in North Carolina when I was 19, so after one year of college. At Wheaton? At Wheaton, yeah. And that's where you uh, you had studies with Mr. Kleinhammer, Ms. Right. Mr. Coker, right. and uh, along the way you had studies with Mr. Jacobs. Right. I think my first lesson with Jacobs was probably after I had started in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Okay. 40-week um, season, so I had summers off. So I would come back to Chicago and take lessons. And some point along in there, uh, Kleinhammer suggested that I should see other people, including uh, Mr. Jacobs. I also saw J. J. Friedman once. Um, and then after my second season in North Carolina, I think after my second season, I had almost a full summer with Mr. Jacobs, and then after my third season in North Carolina, I took a leave of absence and went back to Chicago and studied that whole year primarily with Jacobs, with occasional lessons with Kleinhammer. Um, there were various health issues mm -hmm. with sure. Jacobs during those times where he was, Dave Federley was playing a lot in the orchestra, and uh, so when he would be off the off the radar for a few weeks. I would go see Kleinhammer again, and I was also go back to Kleinhammer just so that he re could remind me of the stuff that yeah he had covered before. Sure. So, do you remember uh, you know, uh, anything about those initial lessons or why you went to see uh, Jacobs other than Mr. Kleinhammer's recommendation? It was mostly Mr. Kleinhammer's recommendation, um, partly because everybody went and studied with Jacobs. That was just the thing to do, you know, go see the master. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think I was looking for anything specific. I just wanted to find out what it was all about, okay. um, get get his ideas on playing. When you went back later, what were you what were you looking for, or what were you expecting, or what were you hoping for? Um, I think when I went back to Chicago, my thought was. Um, I want to get a lot better. I want to get a better job. I had, at that point, probably four solid years with Kleinhammer. Uh, and at that point, my lessons with him were more like reminders. Mm -hmm. He would say things to me, and it was like, yeah, I know that. I'm just not doing it. Um, so I wasn't getting new information. It was basically just confirming what I already knew. and, and uh, I mean. It's not to say it wasn't helpful. I was learning to teach myself at that point, you know, and, and when I heard confirmation from him, you know, he would have the same critiques of my playing that I was feeling, okay, I'm, I'm on the right track, I'm working on the right things. But at that point, I felt like to really progress as a player, I needed new information, I needed a new input, and, you know, Jacobs was the renowned master of low brass playing. I, I would have been foolish not to take advantage of that. So I, in, in our off-camera conversations, I remember you saying that uh, um, comp, uh, Kleinhammer and Jacobs work complementarily in terms of uh, teaching you, but that they did sometimes approach things from a, a similar issue from a, a different point of yeah. view. One, I mean, I, uh, as an example, I was talking to you earlier, um, I had real struggles in the upper register with tightness 
and the, the tongue rising in the back of my mouth and you know the <laughs> creating a valve back there and mm -hmm. resistance to the airstream and and Kleinhammer came at it from the direction of you know you've got to you've got to stop arching that tongue you've, you've got to start stop um, creating that resistance you're 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 sending all this air up from down below and it's just getting choked off and you're you're still char starved for air even though you're working really hard and I had limited success fixing that issue um, Jacobs my recollection is he totally ignored my tongue he just focused right in on my abdomen and said you've got to stop flexing those muscles there you've got to get that soft jelly belly um, you know really focused on that and when I was able to relax down there from the support mechanism my tongue dropped automatically and then I had that free free airflow and much more effortless playing mm -hmm. so just coming at it from a from a different direction um, I think the other thing we talked about um, Kleinhammer really stressed um, getting relaxed getting relaxed and and playing efficiently and you know we would go through you know just you know checking my shoulders checking my abdomen checking everything just really getting the mechanism relaxed in order to make a great sound and my recollection is Jacobs came again from the exact opposite direction just make a great sound get some more Tommy Dorsey in your sound you know sing 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 and the mechanism when I made a, a beautiful rich warm sound the mechanism took care of itself um, so it was same problem different mm -hmm. words um, thinking a, about it a different way that, that, that imitation using use of imitation uh, putting that that imitative thought yeah. Uh, in the mind and then going after the create recreating that yeah is uh, what took you to get the sound which then of course resulted in the in the relaxed production yeah yeah, yeah that's really good the the uh, uh, he would often say imitation is a really powerful learning tool yeah. learning uh, teaching to teaching tool as well mm-hmm uh, the funny thing is he never played in our lessons but you know that rich singing voice that he had yeah and of course he would describe a sound and what I would hear in my head was the many performances and recordings of him and other great players making the kind of sound he was describing so even if I wasn't imitating a sound right next to me I was imitating a sound that I had in my head from listening to great players right but just so again you know he didn't even need to play for you he could just have you conjure up the memory of Exactly. In this case, Tommy Dorsey or some other, right? Some right. other other uh, great player, and then you just go after it from that standpoint. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, when you uh, during your during your lessons with him, did you uh, do much singing or mouthpiece playing or any of that kind of thing? Did he? I never that, remember know? singing, but just tons and tons of mouthpiece playing, um, and mouthpiece playing for fun. Uh, he didn't want me buzzing scales. He didn't want me trying to buzz beautifully in tune arpeggios. Just play, you know, my Bonnie lies over the ocean mm. or, you know, little brown jug or whatever. Fun, bouncy tunes, get that buoyant buzz going, get the air flowing without thinking about it. Um, you know, just playing a tune, being an interpreter on the mouthpiece. Um, and I think he was the one that introduced to me the, the idea of um, first thing of the day, buzz on the mouthpiece for five or ten minutes, however much it takes for you to feel warmed up, mm -hmm. and then make your first notes of the day on the horn, your best notes. Um, don't give yourself permission to sound bad for a few minutes before you sound good. Demand quality right away. And, and that, I have to this day, found very helpful because you know a mouthpiece buzz is going to sound I mean objectively it sounds bad no matter how good the buzz is yeah so there isn't the the psychological pressure to try and sound good you just 
pick it up and blow and buzz and you know do sirens and tunes and whatever and next thing you know your face feels loose and ready to play and you can jump in and play well had you did uh, somehow communicated to him that you had gone through this routine of, of warming up before you gave yourself permission to sound good or was he I don't he... I don't know that I had indicated that I know I had a very rigid daily routine that I learned from Kleinhammer. Um, I don't know that he intended it to be rigid, yeah, yeah. but I had a 20 minute slow arpeggio routine that I would do. I would do slow scales. Uh, I would work my way up into the upper register very gradually. Mm -hmm. um, lots of long tones. You know, just a very deliberate daily routine. And what Jacobs more or less gave me permission to do, at least by, by example, was you know, just jump in and play. Mm -hmm. Jump in and play. Don't be so concerned about it. Um, you still need to cover those things. Yeah, cover all the bases. Right. But um, maybe you can have more fun in your warm-up. And... and you know, he also, now I'm not sure if it was him or Kleinhammer, who discouraged me using the term warm-up. It's not a warm-up, it's a daily routine. You're checking, you're, you're, it's a daily checkup to make sure that everything's functioning right and to make sure that you cover everything so that your playing doesn't stagnate in any particular area. I know that in my own experience with him, and I've heard him in other classes uh, describe this, he he always wanted to have a, a check uh, in terms of get make sure he's on the same page as far as definition of warm up with a with a student. Uh, he would always say, for me, warm up means daily routine. Mm -hmm. And he would he would he would uh, often describe it. To, you know, if you were to take a temperature gauge and measure this area, there's really not any warming up going on because it's already so richly engorged mm -hmm. with blood. Whereas if you were if you're an athlete and you start to do the muscles and get your joints going. If you were to take the temperature gauge, you'd, you'd actually see it. there actually is warming up going on as yeah. the blood flows more fully to those parts of the body. So I know for him, warm up was, was definitely uh, akin to daily routine, but that might have been the case with Kleinhammer too. Mr. Kleinhammer yeah. could have very easily yeah. given you that. And I, you know, I remember one or the other of them saying, you know, your warm up is 30 seconds. And then your daily routine might be an hour. There you go. That sounds, yeah. Um, but that bit about not needing physical warm-up, uh, I don't buy that anymore. I'm 60 now. And, you know, whereas when I was in my 30s, it didn't matter what I did the day before. Mm -hmm. I could pick the horn up and feel good. Now there are days after heavy concerts where I really have to do some serious, it's either warm up or repair work from the day before. Mm -hmm. You know, where you wake up and you just feel stiff. Yeah, it doesn't repair, so, it doesn't regenerate as quickly. Yeah. yeah, and it takes a while. And I also, as I've gotten older, I find I have to take more care in my daily routine so I don't fall back into old habits mm -hmm. that you know I know there are certain ways of playing that I can I can get by forcing and muscling things playing a Shostakovich symphony but if I do that too often it sets up a cycle of only being able to do that mm -hmm. so I need to spend more time every day just reminding myself okay here is that relaxed, free, easy way of playing that you can get away from in an orchestra. Because mm -hmm. um, we're the heavy artillery. Right. And, and while um, soft playing exposes us the most, it's also what we do the least. Most of the time we're in there just pounding away. Mm -hmm. And you can get in some really bad habits if you, if you let you. That's like, true. Let it happen. Did he work on uh, anything breathing with you, or? I know he did. I know he did. 
we we talked about breathing a lot. Again, Kleinheimer and Jacobs get so mixed in my mind. I don't remember what happened from from whom. Um, and at this point, man, I don't remember if my issue was that I tended to breathe high or breathe low. I know I tended to do just one. Mm, okay. And and Jacobs for sure got me maximizing the expansion everywhere. So what he would call the universal breath, regional, rather than the regional breath. Right, yeah. right. And and I I just don't remember if I was a low breather or a high breather. When you worked on that kind of stuff or maybe other non-trombone in the hand stuff, did you, what did you, how'd that work out? He had you put the trombone down and... Put the trombone down, I would blow into various tubes occasionally, you know, those kinds of exercises. I mean, he would, you know, he would poke me in the gut occasionally. No, there, breathe there, or, or where, wherever. Kinds of things you probably can't do these days. Yeah. You know, can't touch students. Um, but um, my strongest memory is just getting me to relax and play. Just, you know, not try quite so hard. Mm -hmm. You know, um, as I was telling you earlier, the the most important lesson that I had with him, the one that that's, sticks with me still, still over these years, um, I was preparing for the Baltimore audition and working through the excerpts and wanted his input on the excerpts and wanted to play Mahler third for him. And for, you know, that whole year, I had been hearing every time I played anything loud for him, anything heavy, don't make that edgy, uh, aggressive orchestral sound. Don't make that your standard loud sound. Make your loud sound rounder. I want to hear more Dorsey, even when you're playing loud. If you play with edge and fire on the sound, it should be a musical choice, not something that happens automatically because that's the way you play. So um, I kept hearing that and I wasn't buying it. Uh, maybe I was buying it intellectually, but I wasn't doing it. Mm -hmm. I think part of it was going and hearing the Chicago Symphony every week and hearing them play Shostakovich and thinking, Man, whenever they play loud, it sure sounds pretty fiery to me. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe not noticing all the times that they just played with big and rich sounds and not realizing how loud that was. So anyway, I wanted to play Mahler third for him and get his musical ideas. And I was smart enough, I guess, to realize, okay, if I just play this as loud as I want to play it, as loud as I know it needs to be on an audition, all I'm going to get from him is what I've heard dozens of times before. It's too edgy. It's too harsh. Don't make that your basic loud sound. So I made the conscious decision, okay, I'm going to play it with that warm, rich sound that he's asking for. I know it's not going to be loud enough, but at least I can get his ideas on the musicality and the pacing of this and you know where to breathe and you know, all, the, all the other stuff. But I'll just let it be a little bit anemic. It'll sound beautiful, but it'll be anemic. So I played through the first section, you know, just trying to play with a rich, warm forte. And he said, you know, that's really very good, but it's much, much too loud. You could never play it that loud in our orchestra. And it was like the light bulb went on. And that's, you know, I don't know if I had the words then, but I was confusing effort with results. And I was equating a certain sound quality with decibel level. If it doesn't have hair on it, it must not be very loud. And I don't know if he did this to me or if I learned it from somebody else, but somewhere around that time, I got a little Radio Shack decibel, decibel, yeah. decibel meter yeah. and started fooling with it. and. Uh, I still, to this day, with, with students, I'll have them 
play Tannhäuser or Mahler Third or Shostakovich Five or something and say, okay, now play this as loud as you can. I want to I want to see how far you can peg this meter. I want to see what your maximum volume is. And, you know, just lay waste to it. And so they do that, and I say, okay, now I want to hear how loud your richest, most beautiful forte is. You know, see, let's see what the distance is between those two dynamics, your maximum and your best quality forte. And nine times out of ten, when they try to play with a good quality forte, it's louder than when they try to play as loud as they possibly can. And again, you see that the eyes open up. Oh! As they're watching the needle. As they're watching the needle yeah. instead of interpreting what they hear with their ears. So they, they realize by watching the needle that the reduced effort is actually producing, producing more, more sound. More sound. More sound. Yeah. And so that's something that that, uh, you, that just came alive yeah. in a lesson yeah. with Jacobs. And, and for me, when, when I'm trying to produce, trying to get back to producing my best loud sound, I keep going back to that, uh, I mean, that Mahler third, I heard the sound and I still know what that felt like and remember what that felt like and putting those two together and just, you know, that easy, effortless playing, that, you know, that was the breakthrough moment where what he said finally connected physically with me so that I could reproduce it. Um, so, you know, that's... Do you, do you recall him working on, uh, with this in mind, uh, just getting the air to the lips or uh, talking about em emphasizing the vowel over consonant? With trombone, you have to articulate everything practically, and was um, there much of that? I'm sure there was. But nothing that comes to Yeah, it. I had had an awful lot of that with, with Kleinhammer sure. already. And I'm sure Jacobs refined that more. Um, but, I mean, I do remember he was in some way, I mean, that uh, Blue Potag book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Blue Book, sure. That we, he would have me play out of. Uh, he was really, really insistent on interpreting those tunes like they were the best music in the world, mm -hmm. and playing the dynamics and playing with the wide dynamic range and you know full rich sound. Um, Kleinhammer used excerpts for that. Okay. Yeah. There was um, you know, etudes were more for developing specific techniques, not for developing um, musical skills. And so with Jacobs, he was approaching it more on the musical skills. Side. side of things, yeah, and using those. Um, and again, I think probably it was easier to get to those musical skills because it wasn't the uh, psychological pressure of, I'm working on these excerpts to get a job. It was, okay, here's this goofy little tune in the blue book, let's see what I can make of it. Yeah, right. It's a whole different mindset. Yeah, yeah, you can take those, take those musical skills and then apply them to the... Uh, yeah, the excerpts. Yeah, that's great. I remember in uh, one of my lessons uh, when I was in my twenties, he talked about growing old gracefully and to learn learn things well when you're young. Did uh, anything like that ever come? Absolutely. Up? Um, he regularly and constantly got on me to don't just breathe enough to play the phrase that you're going to play. Breathe fully. Breathe deeply. Um, you're young, you're healthy, um, if you get in the habit of not breathing fully, you will not be able to breathe fully when you need to. When you, when you hit your 40s, you know, every week I have people coming in in their 40s or 50s whose playing is breaking down because they never developed the habit of breathing fully and deeply. And now as they're aging, they're losing the elasticity in their body, and they right. don't have as much lung capacity, and they they can't do it. You can't develop it at that that late date. So 
you know, take advantage of your youth. Breathe beyond what you think you need. Get that habit going. Fully expand all the time, so that so that you have a reserve you can draw on as you get older. Yeah, and, and related to that, I remember him talking about uh, uh, always protect the ends of your phrases. He said you you'll hear people sound very good on the beginnings of their phrases and even to the middle of their phrases, but by the end of their phrase, because of this breath issue or lack thereof. Yeah. Um, the ends of the phrases don't sound so good, and when you're young, and that's the case then it's going to be disastrous when you get older. Yeah. Well, good, that's a good thing to remember. Yeah. Eric, I'm wondering um, uh, if there was any kind of interesting, unusual moments in lessons where he kind of surprised you with what he noticed. Well, um, there was the week I came in uh, complaining, you know, I have been cracking way too many E-flats and A-flats in loud playing. I just, you know, every time I really go for one, it's a splia. Uh, so he had me play some arpeggios and scales and things in the various keys and pick off E flats and A flats. And I don't know how long it took, probably no more than a minute. He says, you know, your third position's in the wrong place. <laughs> I think it's about an inch and a half too far out. Wow. And, uh, I started fooling with it, and you know he was right. Uh, it was in the wrong place, and I was just lipping things into tune. But in loud playing, I couldn't lip it in tune fast enough. I wasn't strong enough to make a really solid articulation with the slide in the wrong place. Yeah. And once I fixed that, uh, that accuracy issue was a long ways towards being solved. Um, you know, and that's something I think of as I'm teaching even to this day, uh, particularly with, with young students, say, you know, just pick a, pick a position every day and make sure it hasn't drifted on you. Uh, you know, I think what probably had happened with that third position and what happens with some of my students is as they become better players and they're blowing more efficiently, mm. they don't have to compensate for like on those E flats and A flats, I was probably blowing them screamingly sharp. Mm -hmm. And then when Jacobs got me more relaxed and playing more efficiently, the pitch dropped, but I hadn't adjusted the slide position. Um, I see it with students more down in the trigger register, in the low register, where it's really easy to lip notes. You can lip them a third, you know, without much trouble. Yeah. And particularly as tenor trombone players open up and learn to play that trigger register, they'll have gotten in the habit of playing those slide positions really flat because they've been pinching those notes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just have to constantly remind them, don't assume that you know your slide positions. They they change. They change yeah. over time. That's a, that's a great, that's a really good, uh, story just because of the whole as you as you relax the pitch will change and for the better yeah it'll, yeah it'll go down a bit yeah wow. um that that's sometimes a signal to me when my playing is not where it should be mm. i find oh i'm having to push my tuning slide out a little further than usual to stay in tune in the orchestra um i gotta check that out what's going on, and try and get a little more relaxed, maybe practice a little more diligently, and, mm -hmm. and get back to where it, where it should be. You had mentioned um, off camera um, something where you were standing on, on one leg in a lesson. What was that about? Well, um, things like the Brahms First Chorale or Bolero, where, you know, I would have a phobia about coming in on those high notes and, you know, playing what for me is really high register. I'm a second trombone player. So he would have me stand balanced on one foot and start doing knee bends, not very deep, yeah. but just so that I was really focused on staying balanced and say, okay, now I'll play bolero. And uh, sometimes it would be a lot better. So I got better at doing knee bends. It, <laughs> it stopped working. But, but, you know, little things to distract you from the main the thing that's got you yeah. uh, tied up in knots. And, and I think probably that's a 
a lot of why he would do the things blowing into the tubes and, and you know, put the horn down and buzz something else for a while and then come Did back to what was bothering me. And, you know, I would, he would have me buzz things that weren't, at least to me, didn't even seem related to what I was struggling with. And I think, looking back on it, he was probably just breaking, breaking the tension and, and mm -hmm. okay, reset, let's try again. I remember him describing it as going in through the back door of the mind. That's great. You, That's you, great. You know, don't yeah. don't. Uh, he wouldn't. He would. For me, he wouldn't necessarily. He wouldn't confront an issue head on. He would. He would do all these distracted things and take some time. And we're going through this process of these tubes and meters and gauges and whatever. And then now let's go back to that. And then I would play, and yeah. it was much much better. Yeah. And once you've experienced it, then you can reproduce it. Exactly. Because then you can know you can do it. Right. If you can do it once, you know that you have the phys everything physically is there. You're capable. Right. Right. And so if you can do it once, you can do it a million times. Yeah. And and I know I find as a teacher, um, the challenge for me is finding fifteen or twenty or thirty or forty different ways of saying the same thing to try to finally get the student to make the change that right. needs to happen. You know, and and. Sometimes it's the, the stupidest way you say it happens to work for that student. Yeah. You know, and it doesn't work for anybody else, but it works work for that student. And once, again, once they figure it out, I mean, you're, you're just sort of guiding them to where they figure it out with their own self-conscious, sub, their own subconscious and their own bodies, and, and they hear that sound that they've been trying to get. Right. And it's like, yeah, that's it. Oh, well, I can do that. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I, I I recall having similar similar experiences where Jacobs would say something in a lesson, and I I wouldn't really understand it. Um, but then somebody else would say something, maybe a couple weeks later, and then I, oh, that's what he meant. Two weeks later, or two weeks yeah. ago, two weeks ago. Yeah. Or maybe he would say something a month later that would then unlock what he yeah. meant a month earlier somehow. Oh. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be the frustrating thing about both learning and teaching brass instruments. The most important stuff that we do is invisible. Yeah. And all these nerve endings inside your mouth aren't intended to send the information that we need as yeah. brass players. Right. So you've got to come at it through analogy and misdirection and, well, try this, try that. And try. You know, say, oh, oh, okay, now take a breath, you know. Um, which, by the way, doesn't work in certain parts of New Jersey, because then they say, eh, <laughs> eh. <laughs> yeah. I had, to, I had to get away. When I moved to the East Coast, I've pretty much gotten away from using the O syllable and gone to ah, ah, okay. ah because O, oh, the, the, tongue's, the tongue's right where you don't want it. Well, linguistics is important. So. Yeah, and I've also discovered a handful of students from uh, Pennsylvania, there's uh, an air leak in the T mm. in their in their regional. So you know, tss, tss, mm -hmm. there's there's a leaky. Getting them to have a really crystal clear articulation, it's really hard. Wow, that's interesting. That really is. And same thing with uh, maybe um, some some Asian languages as well. Could be where they they just haven't had to use those particular consonants. Yeah, uh, growing up. So, yeah, yeah the control panel, of the mind. Uh, go for the control panel, not for the product. But you know, not for the meth the method or the individual component level, but for the product and the yeah. control panel. You don't drive a car by getting under the hood and manipulating the spark plugs. There right? you go. <laughs> exactly. Amen to that. I heard that. Yeah. Just exactly. step on the gas. Yeah. Well, Eric, I can't thank you enough again for, uh, first of all, preparing Emily and I a wonderful lunch. More than welcome. With dessert and, and a boat ride on the lake and taking time to visit with us about uh, Mr. Jacobs and Mr. Kleinhammer, for that matter. Uh, really, really wonderful. And Puddle's always uh, is uh, on me to make sure I'm a good guest. And so we'd like to present you with this uh, Tuba People TV water bottle. I'll, I'll treasure it. It's, it's suitable for framing or filling. 
and especially useful on the boat. Very good. So, thanks. Thanks a lot, Eric. You're it's welcome. great to meet you. You're welcome. And now back to you. Thank you.